Thanks very much, Jeremy, and thanks to you and Ribka for inviting me to talk about um, uh, really sort of our journey with Capitagravia. So just let me take a minute to share my screen. And just checking now that you can see a full screen. Yeah, looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, so what I hope to do in about 30 minutes is really talk a little bit about the ra rationale for Capitagravia as PrEP, uh, talk a little bit about what we learned from the lessons from phase two studies that really informed some of our thinking for the phase three trials, share with you the, da the data primarily from HPTN 084 because it's what I'm most familiar with, but reflect on sort of uh, consistencies with the data from 083, but also what else we've learned from 083, which was a, a sibling trial, and then spend a couple of minutes really telling you what I think, uh, what I know are the next steps in terms of the trials, but also kind of in terms of thinking about programs. Um, so just taking you back in history, um, some of you may recall that in 2015, WHO recommended that oral prep be, uh, or oral prep uh, containing TDF, mostly TDF FTC, be offered as an additional uh, prevention choice as part of a comprehensive package of HIV prevention. And since then, what we've seen, and, and this recommendation was based off the back of a systematic review of several trials in multiple populations and uh, diverse geographies, which showed a sort of consistent trend towards efficacy, especially with uh, daily use. So th since then, we've seen oral PrEP be rolled out in more than 70 countries and programs. Um, but I think sort of one of the key observations is that uh, although there has been a rapid expansion and although in fact the South African program is one of the leading programs globally in terms of new PrEP initiations, uh, that initiation is not necessarily translating into effectiveness. Uh, and this is a systematic review of 41 programs that found uh, that about a third of people discontinue PrEP by month one. Um, and these early discontinuations are thought to be less likely to uh, change in risk and more likely for other reasons. Um, and across a number of uh, evaluations that have been done to date of sort of qualitative and quantitative studies, there are sort of some consistent messages about why people may be discontinuing oral PrEP, and it sort of falls into three broad categories. The first is just the drug, that some people sort of report problems with side effects associated with taking oral TDF FTC. Largely, people experience a mild um, ART startup uh, set of symptoms and about one in 10 people, they may have GIT side effects or, or headache, but if they're not adequately counseled, this can sometimes be an issue. Some people, particularly younger populations have complained about the pill size or else there really is just sort of the, the, the challenge of taking a pill a day. There are some health systems issues. So in some jurisdictions, uh, PrEP comes at a cost. Uh, in many parts of our region, the issue is really access. We've not seen full scale up of programs. And so if people move around, they kind of have uh, PrEP interruptions. And then, you know, kind of there have been restrictions on resupply, which means that people, healthy people are essentially coming to clinics for resupply and that's an issue. Um, uh, and then also there are sort of the, the, the social context issues that ARTs are frequently confused uh, for, uh, the PrEP pills are frequently confused as ART for treatment. People are sort of thought to be living with HIV. There may be associated judgment or discrimination. And for women, uh, there may be the additional threat of intimate partner violence if partners think either that they are living with HIV or that in some ways they are um, having more than one partner. So there are a couple of reasons, as you can see, to kind of think about um, alternatives beyond pills for HIV prevention, methods that could be longer acting, that could be more discreet. Um, and there is also some data, uh, there was a study done in um, here in South Africa, a discrete choice experiment that really explored with adult men and women, as well, well as adolescents and female sex workers, their preferences for long acting PrEP. Um, and sort of anything to uh, going towards the left is really kind of uh, relative to the other methods indicates uh, a lack of preference and going towards the right indicates a strong preference. And what you can see is that 
across all populations, there was a strong preference for injectable um, PrEP. It's important to reflect that this data is hypothetical um, or, and, you know, kind of people have most experience with using injections, particularly women use injectable contraceptives. So perhaps it's not surprising that people would have a preference for an injection. What's interesting is that this preference um, was also observed sort of uh, in reality in um, in HPCN 076, which looked at uh, prevention preferences. And this is where people had experience of using these products um, and, you know, kind of had sort of before and after comparisons. But overwhelmingly, again, there are preferences for injectables. So there is a strong demand, particularly in our region, for HIV prevention products that could be injectable based. And this is, um, this is great. So what are the possible candidates for an injectable product. Well, enter stage left, cabotegravir. This was an experimental product. Uh, it's an integrase inhibitor. It's an analog of dolutegravir, which means it's very similar to dolutegravir, but it's not the same. And it's been really important at particular times to kind of make this distinction. Um, but like dolutegravir, it has a high genetic barrier to resistance. And because of its uh, pharmacokinetic properties and also its physical structure, so the difference, I think, of a couple of H's and O's, uh, basically means it can be nanomilled and then suspended in a suspension, which allows you then to kind of uh, inject it as a depot injection. And early HIV treatment studies uh, where it was used in combination with ropivirine had shown that it had strong uh, anti-HIV activity and high resistance, a high barrier for resistance. So uh, potentially uh, a valuable PrEP agent. Additional data came really from uh, non-human primate studies. Here are two studies uh, that were focused on looking at um, protection in female uh, macaques. Um, in the one panel, it shows a, a study done in macaques that were treated with DMPA, and you can see six out of eight were protected compared to zero controls. And in the other panel, uh, in pigtail macaques, you have a menstrual cycle similar to, um, to humans um, and didn't require DMPA treatment. You can see that there was 100% protection. The other thing that these macaque studies did was give us uh, pharmacokinetic targets to to aim for, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So we had uh, NHP data that suggested that, uh, in a, in, so we had clinical data to show that there was strong anti-HIV activity, and NHP data to suggest that, you know, kind of cavitegravir could protect against uh, HIV infection. The other thing that was important uh, was really some early work done with single dose studies in humans looking at concentrations of cabotegravir in um, genital tissue, so the site where you would expect HIV infection. And importantly, um, these studies show that concentrations of drug in the cervical tissue were above these PK targets. So 0.166 micrograms per mil is a, a, a protein adjusted IC90 target that would sort of thought to be uh, um, associated with protection based on those NHP data that I showed you. So some, some less certainty around rectal um, tissue. Um, and again, you know, kind of, we remain uncertain generally about what concentrations we should have in genital tissue, but um, it may be important and I'll come back to this point later. So it was really on the back of that data that the Cabotegravir development program evolved. There was a treatment program and there's been significant progress to advance Cabotegravir through such that it's now registered in combination with Rolpivirine as a treatment in the USA and Canada and uh, in parts of Europe and uh, in South Africa. Um, I think Azincha is involved in the study kind of that would support licensure potentially here. What I want to do is really focus on the prevention program. So there was a goal to kind of develop uh, evidence to support prevention in MSM and trans women who are considered at-risk populations, as well as cisgender women uh, with large markets potentially or populations who would be who would benefit uh, in in sub-Saharan Africa. And there were two 
the phase two studies that were developed. Eclair was a study done in the US largely in an MSM population, and then HPCN 077, which included a small proportion of women. Um, and these were the phase two studies prior to uh, 083 and 084, and their goal was really to establish safety and uh, dose actually for the phase three trials. So a couple of things emerged during the phase two trials that sort of became quite relevant. In Eclair, at the time, the dose that was being used, you can see here is 800 milligrams every 12 weeks. Uh, and the purple lines are really what they had simulated in a population PK model would be uh, sort of the, the dosing based on sort of the PK targets that I'd mentioned that are associated with protection. But unfortunately, in the actual study, if you look at the green lines, you can see that they basically drop below the purple lines. So, and they're dropping to some extent below this target threshold of what we call four times the PAIC90. So there was a concern that 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 in fact what we were seeing in men in particular were that we weren't hitting target thresholds. And so in HPTN 077, they also saw similarly um, that uh, they, they saw a similar phenomenon. And so what they did was to add on an additional cohort, cohort two, where they looked at evaluating 600 milligrams every eight weeks. And what you can see across the two panels is that the 600 milligrams eight weekly achieved much better target concentrations, some uh, declines in lower concentrations in men compared to women. But generally after the first dose, the majority of people achieved above four times the PAIC90. And so that was the dose that was selected to go into the phase three trials. Another issue that emerged in the phase two studies, which is sort of um, noteworthy, but uh, didn't immediately have clinical significance, was data that was presented uh, from the Eclair study, the first study in MSM in the US that I mentioned, which showed that uh, even after 52 weeks after the last cabotegravir injection, uh, there was still a proportion of the population uh, who, um, had detectable drug concentrations, uh, are, you know, kind of a year after their last injection. Um, this has also been observed in HBTN 077. So here you can see out to week 60 in men, still about 8% of men and 23% of women have drug sort of in the order of one to four times the PAIC90. And out at week 76, women still have uh, prolonged concentrations. So this is what, where we talk about the long pharmacokinetic tail of cabotegravir. And its clinical significance at the time was um, theoretical, but nevertheless, uh, a concern. And the theoretical concern was that if you have people that have declining uh, rates essentially of uh, an ART monotherapy and they're exposed to uh, HIV, uh, is there potential for there to um, sort of emerge resistant virus under the constraints of monotherapy? So this was a sort of hypothetical concern. People talk a lot about the pharmacokinetic tail, but I'll show you some data from the trials that sort of may shed some more light on this issue. So going into the trials, these were the two issues that we considered, the dose, and also we're aware of this long PK tail, longer in women. The upside is that a longer tail potentially means greater injection uh, forgiveness. So, you know, kind of that, particularly in women, there may be some forgiveness if there were delays in, in, in attending injection visits. So then moving on to the phase three trials, uh, the goals really of these two trials were to evaluate the, the efficacy of um, cabotegravir compared to oral TDF FTC, which is the standard of uh, PrEP currently for HIV prevention and also to compare the safety. And what was remarkable about these two trials is that they were sort of the first of a new generation of trials that were no longer placebo controlled, but that were using TDF-FTC as an active comparator. Um, and so uh, if I take you through the design, there are a couple of unique features in addition to there being an active comparator, which are um, related to some of the issues that I've raised. So the first thing is that every participant was either randomized to active cabotegravir or a tr a Truvada placebo or else Truvada active and placebo cab. 
the study, all, all participants uh, were randomized, went through an oral lead-in phase, which was five weeks long, uh, and they all received oral uh, pills at this point. The rationale for the oral lead-in was really that at this stage, we didn't have lots of people who'd had um, cabotegravir injections, and there was a theoretical concern that people who experienced hypersensitivity or other tolerability issues, once you administer the injection, you can't take it out. So an oral lead-in with an oral pill would allow us to understand any tolerability issues uh, with, uh, with pills, which would have a relatively shorter half-life compared to an injection. And the five-week period was chosen because based on the literature, about 95% of most adverse events will occur in the four, first four weeks of product administration. And so this was felt like a useful catch-all. The second step is the injection step. And here, everyone either received an active injection or a placebo or um, along with uh, active pills or placebo. So if you're in the Truvada group, you obviously received active Truvada and a placebo injection. Um, and here, uh, injections were administered once every four weeks uh, with an initial loading dose of two injections four weeks apart and then eight weekly. Uh, and then in this final step, this was really for people who discontinued uh, cabotegravir uh, prematurely or discontinued their injections prematurely, um, also women who became pregnant. And this was where they were offered 48 weeks of Truvada in order to cover that uh, PK tail that I mentioned with the idea that if they were exposed to infection, perhaps the combination of Truvada and Cabotegravir would uh, prevent the emergence of resistance. And again, these two steps, step one and step three, were really kind of part of um, the safety mechanisms of the trial and not envisaged for real life implementation, uh, but sort of out of an abundance of caution uh, while we learned more about sort of Cabotegravir in the context of these trials. So just then moving to the results of 084, we um, screened sort of over four and a half thousand women. We enrolled 3,224 at uh, 20 sites in seven countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here you can see the participant characteristics, which really highlight, you know, kind of the, that they are a PrEP eligible population. So, you know, just over a half were 25 years or younger. The majority were not living with a partner. Um, they had risk factors for HIV, either partners with HIV or multiple partners or engaged in transactional sex or a small fraction anal sex. We measured this using something called the voice risk score. Um, and uh, scores of above five have been associated with an HIV incidence per year of about 6%. So this was an at-risk population. You can also see from the prevalence of curable STIs that they were uh, at risk. Um, so then moving on, here is the primary outcome. Uh, over, we, we um, had an interim DSMB in no, 5th of November, 2020. Uh, and the DSMB reviewed the data and they reviewed these 40 infections that had occurred over just under 4,000 person years uh, with a pooled incidence of about 1%. And what they saw was this very stark distribution of infections in the CAB versus the Truvada arm. So four in the Cabotegravir arm, 36 in the Truvada arm. Uh, that translated to an incidence of 0.2% in, in the Cabotegravir group and just under 2% in the Truvada group. And I think I can speak confidently that uh, there, there have not been many results that we've observed in HIV prevention trials in women that have really shown these incidence rates. And if you think of the 073 trial that's just stopped recently, the incidence there was 4%. So both agents were highly effective in preventing HIV, but um, Cabotegravir was obviously much more effective than Truvada. And here's that um, Kaplan-Meier graph, which just sort of illustrates that point that women in the Cabotegravir group had about 89% uh, lower risk of HIV infection compared to the Truvada group. And you can see here just that the graph spit splits very early and remains consistently split over time. So the DSMB told us, in fact, that, you know, kind of it was very close in May when they had stopped our sibling study, the 083 study, for much the same results. So here are the 083 results just for comparison. They enrolled a larger population, so just over four and a half thousand men. 
their pooled incidence was also under 1%, um, and they had observed a 66% reduction uh, in infections in the cab Tegravir group. They, the, they had observed 13 infections in the cab group and 39 in the, in the Truvada group, um, but really kind of trending along the same lines. And one of the reasons that we have sort of hypothesized that we saw these differences, because it's sort of quite difficult to pit drug against drug, just with the sort of different modes of delivery, is that potentially um, uh, Cabotogravir conferred an adherence advantage. So this is data from an adherence subset, 375 uh, women who sort of contributed samples that were tested uh, throughout follow-up. Um, so this is over the course of 57 weeks. You can see that overall, um, there were sort of two thirds of women had detectable uh, tenofovir, uh, about 46%, so just under half had levels consistent with do uh, seven doses a week. Uh, but this declines with time. And I think this reflects kind of people's difficulty with taking pills over a prolonged period, particularly for a prevention effect where they have no sort of obvious side effects that might, or symptoms that might motivate use. By comparison, here are the sort of proxy measures of um, cabotegravir adherence in the sense that you're requiring people to come to visits every eight weeks. And you can see that out to 30 months, still 90% of planned visits occurred. Um, sort of explaining, I think, sort of the differences that we see in effect. So what can I tell you about these four breakthrough infections in uh, 084? They're quite interesting, and I'll spend a few minutes just unpacking some of what we've learned. Uh, in uh, 084, we only had four infections, as I mentioned. Two of them occurred in people, so this B1 and B2, occurred in women who never received injections. They had their infection detected during the oral lead-in phase, the first one. Uh, was delayed in returning uh, for her injection visit and at, at, at her return uh, it was determined that she had HIV. Subsequent drug level testing showed that she had been non-adherent to the oral lead-in. Uh, with the second case B2, she tested pregnancy positive at her uh, first injection visit, so never received any injections, was uh, transition to open label Truvada, uh, which she took throughout her pregnancy, but then uh, after delivery had some interruptions in drug resupply and um, seroconverted to HIV. So the remaining two cases are of interest because they're uh, in people who look like they acquired infection during injections. And we, you know, kind of it's important for us to understand why did the drug potentially not protect people. So just to remind you, I want to talk about sort of the potential points where infections might take place and sort of what we know about them. The first is that people could be infected uh, prior to receiving injections. We did have a screening algorithm which included RNA testing sort of within 14 days of product administration. Uh, but there is still a window in which people have, could have acquired early infection. There is obviously the period during the oral lead-in where people are taking pills daily, uh, where you could have infection. We don't actually, I mean, we expect or we can extrapolate based on Truvada that uh, oral cab could work as PrEP, but we don't have data on oral cab as PrEP. And so, you know, kind of this is a period of vulnerability. There's obviously the period during uh, the injection phase where uh, people may delay visits and have declining uh, drug levels, or perhaps the drug is just not robust enough, and we can talk about that a bit more. And then there's obviously this period where people have stopped their injections and they're in uh, this open label Truvada phase. And this was the area where we were concerned about resistance. So let me tell you what we've learned. So the first case that I, sh or the case that I showed you um, that, uh, basically appeared to have uh, injections, uh, consistent injections, and still had a breakthrough infection. Uh, if you look at this graph below, what you can see are the blue line is the point at which she first tested positive. The green lines are injections, and the red line is when a lab sophisticated laboratory testing actually sort of back tested all the samples and, and identified her first true positive visit. 
And so what we uh, learned is that, in fact, she was positive at enrollment. Um, and then if you look up at the top here at these uh, tables, just showing you the results of the different testing, what you can see uh, along this line is that her first reactive test was at week 33, where she had an antigen antibody test positive, but all the other tests were negative. And then a week later, she had um, a, a DNA that, that was sort of uh, low positive. Uh, she then would have gone through a testing algorithm, which would eventually have confirmed infection. But at the central lab, when test, back testing was done, what they saw was that those two visits where there were positives at site, they also picked up two antigen antibody tests positive. But when they went back and looked at RNA, there was really nothing. Single copy assays were negative all the way back to the oral lead-in phase. And they tested right the way back to enrollment. And here you can see the first positive. Um, and then sort of relatively no, low copy numbers during the oral lead-in phase, uh, you know, perhaps with intermittent dosing, you know, there was some emergence of viral replication. But as soon as the injection was administered, it pretty much suppressed uh, viral replication. So <laughs> indications that it's good as a therapy, but not what we want in the case of, of PrEP. Um, where uh, this is a, a sort of potential area of concern. Fortunately, this woman uh, did not have any resistance detected and had wild-type virus, and she transitioned to a DTG-based regimen and is suppressed. Um, sorry, the formatting's got a bit wrong. So she... Um, So sorry, that, that, is the, that is the case that has gone from a D case to an A case. So she was found to be positive at enrollment. And then this other D case, you can see again, the same setup. So uh, the green lines are injections. The time, the, the blue line is the time the site detects the case. The red line is the time the laboratory center detects the case. You can see the yellow lines are capitogravir concentrations. So during the oral lead in she did not have detectable drug concentrations. She took a couple of injections to reach um, above eight times the PAIC90. So she had drug concentrations that we would expect, but she had a number of uh, delayed visits, including this last one where there was a 16 week delay between her last injection and the current one. And you know, kind of we we're aiming for eight weeks. And so at that visit, her, her drug le levels had declined to below uh, target concentrations of at least sort of four to eight times the PAIC90. Um, fortunately, she was, uh, if you look then at her testing profile, you can see it's much more typical. She had a positive antigen antibody test and then a viral load that was detectable uh, across two visits. And she was linked to care and um, started on TEE and has also kind of successfully suppressed. So I think the cases in 084 are illustrative, but um, we have very few data points. Um, the cases in 083, uh, I think, are a bit more illustrative and, and, and sort of have generated some anxieties, but I think we have to be sensible about sort of how we interpret these. So uh, they have observed a couple, they, like us, they also observed a number of cases that were prevalent cases, but that went on to kind of have at least one injection as indicated by the green circles and subsequently to, to have infection identified. Unfortunately, in a couple of these cases, at least one, uh, the, 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 the case did go on to develop INSTI resistance uh, during the period sort of um, while infection was being detected. Uh, in, if we look at these B cases, these are cases in people who have had a CAV interruption and have not had injections for a while. So these would be equivalent to tail phase cases. And what you can see is that these uh, infections are all wild type. And so our concerns about uh, tail phase resistance have not been realized as yet. Uh, but, you know, kind of we need to accumulate more data, but this is somewhat reassuring. And what the pharmacologists tell me is that, you know, kind of generally when they want to induce resistance, they do escalating doses, not de-escalating doses. So perhaps, you know, kind of it's the de-escalating dose that, that maybe sort of uh, mean that we are able to kind of escape that risk. These C-group infections are infections that occur during the oral lead-in. 
And what you can see again is this effect of delays in diagnosis, uh, mean that people are administered injections. And then subsequently, when HIV is diagnosed at the site, uh, there has been the emergence of NCD resistance. And the cases that have sort of caused, I think, sort of the most, uh, uh, I, I, you know, kind of have caused the most sort of uh, interest really are these cases, which appear to occur in people who've had on time injections um, and, uh, you know, kind of no, no obvious delays that would have led to declines in drug concentrations as we saw in 084. And yet they still appear to have uh, breakthrough infections. And in a couple of these cases, Delay in the one case, uh, there were delays in linking this person to care, and so they all, they also developed resistance. In another case, associated with resistance. Um, just kind of for completeness' sake, to say that in 084, but also in 083, most of the Truvada incident infections were in people who had poor or inconsistent uh, adherence, and so you know, kind of insufficient drug levels to. Uh, achieve protection. And so when they were exposed to HIV, they became HIV infected. Um, I think the key messages just around this section and one that's sort of worthy of more discussion is that many of these breakthrough infections were associated with undetectable or low drug concentrations in 084. Um, that clearly across 083 and 084, the detection of infection with long acting products is delayed. And this is likely to be an issue with all long acting products because they're so powerful at suppression of viral replication that our routine diagnostics just don't pick uh, up um, antibody signals because of sort of um, low level replication, not triggering sort of traditional antibody responses and, you know, kind of after, un unless there's some prolonged period. Uh, importantly, we didn't see tail phase seroconversion associated with resistance, so that's a relief, but more data would be reassuring. And when we did see breakthrough infections at ex expected drug concentrations, they uh, were associated with NCD resistance. Um, and this sort of, th there's a lot more discussion about this, but uh, what we notice is that these breakthrough infections are associated with low viral load at early visits. What's important and reassuring, and I think really important from a programmatic perspective, is that all of these people went on to be linked to ART regimens. Uh, in some cases, in most cases, they were in fact PI regimens, and they were suppressed. So their, AR, their, their HIV uh, is managed. Uh, and we will definitely learn more from the ongoing CAB trials about sort of accumulating infections. We'll learn more in 084 about whether the trend we saw with existing infections uh, is sort of consistent or whether we start to see patterns that are more like 083. So just a quick note on safety uh, for those of you who kind of are thinking about this from also kind of what it means for programs. Essentially, both, the, both drugs were safe and well tolerated. The only difference between the two groups was that there were more injection site reactions in the CAB group than the Truvada group. These were generally seen at the first injection and sort of declined with time. Uh, and uh, definitely there were lower rates of ISR in the women's trial compared to the men and uh, trans women's trial. And there are a number of sort of hypotheses about why those might be. But most importantly, in 084, there were zero discontinuations due to injection site reaction. So um, these were generally well tolerated, uh, associated with pain, but quite mild and rapidly resolving. Just a point about uh, adverse events generally, uh, there were no big differences between Cabotagria and Truvada uh, in 084, a couple of minor differences in 083. Uh, these are sort of events uh, sort of listed most commonly. Um, also importantly, people were worried about weight gain associated with NCDs. We didn't see any differences in weight gain in the two trials. And given the the dolutegravir story, although the numbers are small, it was also important to re report that we didn't see any congenital anomalies or negative pregnancy outcomes uh, amongst women who received cabotegravir. So just to uh, sum up, both agents were highly effective in preventing HIV. It's impressive that the overall incidence in these trials was 1% when you consider that they were a high-risk population. 
clearly Camotegravir was superior to oral Truvada in preventing HIV. Both products were safe and well tolerated. The main difference is really injection site reactions, but these are generally mild and self-limiting. With respect to breakthrough infections, I think we've learned that there's a challenge to detect them with uh, conventional testing algorithms. Uh, many infections will still be associated with undetectable drug as we saw in 084. Uh, unfortunately, delays in detection may be associated with resistance, and so we may have to rethink our testing algorithms. Uh, and, you know, kind of, uh, but fortunately in 084, we haven't seen any NST mutations. And my comment to that, and I meant to make it earlier, is if you recall that slide I showed you about drug concentrations in genital tissues, you'll recall that drug concentrations were higher in cervical and vaginal tissue than they were in rectal tissue. So this is one of the theories, is that maybe we're getting better drug concentrations in the female genital tract for a change than than in the rectal compartment, but you know, kind of we need to investigate this further. So what happens next? We've done a protocol amendment to offer people in the Travada group Cabochegravia, and that's going through approval processes. The 083 has already started their amendment. This includes an optional oral lead-in where we'll learn more about sort of the acceptability of the oral lead in and whether people go straight to direct to inject. Uh, in the women's study, we will uh, now uh, uh, allow for active dosing through pregnancy and collect safety and PK data, basically to kind of reassure ourselves that there are no additional uh, adverse events during pregnancy or that we need dose adjustments during pregnancy. And interestingly, in the amendments, we're going to include RNA testing as part of our regular testing algorithm so that we can learn a little bit more about whether we could detect infections earlier with RNA testing. And then just additional activities that are going on at the moment that are going to help us with programs. Um, in South Africa with HERO, we've done a cost effectiveness evaluation to kind of look at what would the um, threshold be for cost in order to still sort of be a uh, ensure cost effectiveness. Well, there's also some work to evaluate very uh, viral load platforms for future use if we have to do viral load testing and sort of thinking about how many of those could be point of care or near point of care. There's work looking at some of our stored samples to see whether we, you know, kind of whether we still achieve significant drug concentrations for injections that were delayed through 12 weeks. And so could you extend the dosing interval for women? Um, we also don't really know what the correlates of protection are yet. And so there'll be work to sort of do a case cohort analysis looking at sort of correlates of protection uh, in the CAB group. Uh, and then there's ongoing analysis of the infections in the unblinded phase as we accumulate more infection data to just learn more about sort of the, the range of infections you might see in, uh, on cabotegravia. So obviously the work of many people, it's been um, a very um, sort of exciting trial to work on and I'm, I'm really happy to take questions and also should give a shout out to Ribka who's uh, been a stalwart on our uh, clinical um, safety committee and responded to sites regularly about sort of what they need to do about safety events. So thanks very much to, to Ribka. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much. That's uh, such interesting data and such, such fantastic work between the, the two trials. Um, lots of questions coming in. Some on my, some on my phone, some on the Q&A box. So I'm going to go through some of them. Um, one, one question was in the transition from oral treatment to the injectables. Was that an abrupt transition or was there an overlap period with both oral and injectables? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, essentially sort of at the week five, people would have had their last uh, oral cab dose the night before. And then would, if they had negative HIV or and pregnancy tests, they would have had an injection the next day. Um, so, you know, kind of we would have expected there to be a little bit of overlap, but not a lot. Um, and I think sort of the point maybe that's being made is, is there a period of vulnerability in that transition? Uh, I think you can see from some of the infections I showed you that a lot of people were not very reliable pill takers. And so, you know, kind of I, I think that the, the major reason for infections in the oral lead in is just that people are not very good at taking pills every day. Many of these populations are sort of have chaotic lives and, you know, kind of pill taking uh, regimen and daily pill taking regimen is tough. Sorry, I managed to meet myself. Uh, and then a very good question about 
drug drug interactions in with regards to TB. So rifampicin or rifapentine is cabotegravir out in that case, or, or can it still be used? Yeah. So um, in in the trial, we um, because of some concerns, particularly about sort of rifampicin drug drug interactions that you would sort of achieve. You basically it's a Rifampicin is a perpetrator, so you have issues with the cabotegravir concentrations. Um, and so we were required to put people on Trivada during this uh, step. They have updated the, the IB, and my sense is that there are now some guidelines on dosing, but there's a preference for rifibutin because you seem to be able to kind of uh, not have such a sort of undermining effects on cabotegravir concentrations. So I think there's a recognition that we are going to be using these drugs in settings where people will have TB, but you know, kind of there's probably still a little bit of work to be done about sort of thinking about individual cases in front of you, uh, especially when it comes to prep. Yeah, it's going to be a fascinating one. Um, then um, uh, questions about HIV two. Uh, they're saying are there any trials for HIV two ongoing? I assume not really. I mean, it's not a big. World Health issue, yeah. but in, I suppose in some regions it is. Uh, so it wasn't sort of a particular focus. All our testing looks at HIV 1 and 2. Uh, I don't think we had any particular cases of HIV 2. There were some odd cases where, uh, you know, kind of they were sort of difficult to diagnose and there was a suspicion that maybe we were seeing HIV 2. Um, we think, uh, you know, kind of the Cabotegravir will work the same, um, but it's kind of really not enough cases to kind of be able to say definitively. I think programs will teach us that. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, and then uh, one of the one of the other attendees asked about the cause of deaths in the cabotegravir group. Um, well, <laughs> well spotted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these were all not related to a study product. There was a woman who had a, a cerebrovascular accident and subsequently demise. There was a woman who uh, had um, a cardiomyopathy, uh, secondary to hypertensive uh, heart disease, and she hadn't been on injections for a while, and she uh, had a worsening um, cardiac case and, and demise. And then the third case was an unusual case, but also uh, had not been in contact with the sites for a while. She complained of a severe headache um, and we really don't have a full story because her family suspected witchcraft and they spirited her off to the rural areas where she subsequently demise and uh, she was uh, rapidly buried. And so there was no autopsy, but it didn't sound like, didn't sound like an associated uh, or a cabotegravir associated issue. So they were all attributed as not product related by investigators who were blinded, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then a, a good question about whether you, the study at all was able to answer the question about any risk compensation or changes in risk behavior, such as through STI incidents or anything else like that? Yeah, um, so one of the slides I didn't show you, but that we have presented before shows STI incidents in the uh, in both groups, it's equal by arm, and um, you know, kind of, we don't see evidence that uh, risk increases. We do see that there is ongoing risk, um, and so I, I think, sort of, my feelings about risk compensation are that you know, kind of, what we want is really harm reduction for people who already have uh, high rates of risk because of their sexual behavior, um, and arguably drugs like cabotegravir are very important for this population because they're not reliant on sort of self-administrations for maintenance. Yeah, agreed. Um, and then a question which I'm sure you've, you've had before about the, whether there's studies about cabotegravir being combined with hormonal injectables for contraceptives uh, or other similar agents to give sort of a two-in-one injection. Is that anything in the pipeline? I mean, down the line? Yeah, so I mentioned that already we're interested in sort of what we can do to align contraceptive visits with cab visits. So with NetN, there's alignment every eight weeks. If we can extend the dosing interval to 12 weeks based on our data, that would align with DMPA. And then further down the line, the, we have a concept in at the HPTN on our working with Vive on a combination product, which would be a combination of Levonorgestrel and CAB injectable. So there is an ambition to develop a multi-purpose technology that would be injectable. 
and the timeline yeah. on that is, you know, kind of in the next, the, the really sort of, it could get going in the next year. Okay, that's, that's, that's impressively quick. Um, and then a lot of questions about all the sort of potential barriers to, to implementation. And I know you did cover a lot of them in, in the last few slides as well. But um, for example, I mean, do, do you think that the, an oral lead in dose is going to be required you know, sort of permanently or, or are, they, are there ways of avoiding that in a programmatic setting? Do you think you'd ever start with injection straight? Yeah, no, well, that's what we want to demonstrate in the, in the uh, open label amendments. We have removed the requirement for an oral lead in, we've made it optional. So we'll, we'll learn about how acceptable yeah. that is. Um, you know, kind of the review of the safety data across both the treatment and, and prevention programs at this point has not detected any safety signals during the first four weeks. So there is comfort that we are not going to kind of encounter any problems unless they're exceedingly rare. Um, and, you know, kind of so there, there, there is a move, I think, to move towards direct to inject, because as we've talked about, the period of the oral lead in is a potential period of vulnerability for, for populations that may select um, injectable PrEP. Yeah, agreed. Um, and then I know you mentioned as well, you know, part of the ongoing work would be looking at cost effective analyses and things like that. I mean, do you, I mean, I, I know it's very hard to say, you know, ahead of time, but I mean, do you think this is likely to be um, a, an affordable option, even just leaving out cost effectiveness? Because obviously, you know, the, the, bird, the prevention benefit of HIV is, is a significant cost um, reduction. But I mean, is this likely to be a very expensive drug intrinsically or? Is it likely to come down sort of for low middle income country settings with mass production and things like that if it was if it was uh, implemented? Yeah, so this is by no means my area of expertise, but I mean, I really understand that if you think about the Dolly Tegrevia story, it's about volumes that help with price. Um, with Dolly Tegrevia, what they were able to do was negotiate um, uh, sort of generic manufacturing or manufacturing outside of GSK and that sort of helped uh, reduce costs. There are limitations with Capitogria because the nano milling I mentioned is a kind of sophisticated approach that perhaps fewer uh, companies, you know, kind of that could be outsourced to fewer companies. But I think on the other hand, and, and you know, we've been engaged in discussions with the Department of Health and the PrEP Technical Working Group, and there's huge enthusiasm. Um, and sort of part of this is that, you know, kind of everyone I think in South Africa knows that our current PrEP program has real limitations. We're initiating a lot of, a lot of people, but we're not getting much follow-up, you know, kind of beyond the first month or the first six months. So what has been done is a kind of threshold analysis to say, you know, kind of, could it still be affordable or cost effective, even if the cost was sort of, uh, you know, kind of one times, two times, three times, all the way up? And I think there's a, you know, kind of there's a reasonable range. The company have been very tight lipped about what their cost is going to be. They're they're kind of interested in the outcome of these analyses, and I think there's a real desire to kind of ensure that there is access. Uh, in our region. And, you know, kind of, the, it's going to be a while before other long acting products come along. The vaginal ring will really be sort of the only kind of competitor and it has a much more modest efficacy. So, you know, kind of, I, I do think that there is space for Cabotogravia. And if, you know, kind of governments can see, although there's a, an affordability issue, but the kind of the, the cost effectiveness or the trade off in terms of prevention of infections. Will still make it worth it for them, I think. You know, and th there's going to be some negotiating, but I think it looks quite favourable already. Yeah, uh, agreed. And yeah, as you say, the downstream cost saved are enormous. I mean, even, even if we just restrict ourselves to cost, which is not necessarily the only thing you know to consider. Um, and then um, you mentioned other injectables. I mean, are, are these? You know, there's, there's always, I mean, there's certainly other long acting uh, ARVs in the pipeline, but presumably these are years away from PrEP. I mean, the trials still have to be out and, and done. I mean, do you, do you see Cabotegrave as being the only show in town on, on long acting injectables for PrEP for several years, or, or is this likely to be something which in 12 months we'll be talking about the next drug? You know, it's hard to say. I think, um, in some, to, to some respects, you know, kind of some people are enthused by the fact that we saw that the trial stopped early on 084 and they're hoping that similarly, you know, kind of other trials may stop early for benefit. Um, so there are two trials that are currently starting in South Africa and in the region. The one is the Islatrovir trial, which is a monthly pill. Um, it's MK85 
uh, 9-1 um, made by Merck. Uh, so those trials have started, you know, kind of they, they expect that they would have results by 2023. Um, and then the other trial of interest is really the Lena Kapavir trial, which will also be done in South Africa in combination with sort of D Discovy. So it's a two drugs compared to Truvada also in women. Uh, and both are projected to have results kind of in 2023, but I think they're hoping that they might declare earlier because, you know, kind of uh, pill, daily pill taking is a challenge. Latrovia is a monthly pill, so it's not quite the same. But there is still the process to, you know, get the, the, the drugs approved by the regulatory authorities, get guidelines in. So there may be a year or two where we have cabotegravir before we have other drugs. And some of the issues we're picking up on cabotegravir, like the testing algorithms, are going to be more similarly relevant for these other drugs. So, you know, kind of we'll learn a lot from the first long acting. Yeah, no, it's it's clearly the uh, clearly the leader in the in that field. Um, and then just uh, two last questions, if if you're okay. So one is one is about, and, and again, I'm sort of asking you to keep gazing into the crystal ball here. But in terms of our timing, in terms of uh, the sort of a, a wide scale adoption, say by WHO or some of the bigger countries. I mean, do you think that would is that in your kind of opinion, is that something which in the next year they would say consider once the cost effective analyses have been done, or is this something that you think regulators are going to sit on for a couple of years at least to see before there's any sort of wide scale adoption? Yeah, no, I I have been impressed with how um, how enthusiastic people are to kind of move uh, new products forward. So the the dossier has been submitted by the drug company to. Uh, for cabotegravir, so to the FDA, who gave it breakthrough status, which basically means they commit to reviewing the dossier and making a recommendation within, ideally, within 12 months. So they may make a recommendation uh, toward the end of the year, early January, and that would sort of mean licensure in the US. There is also a commitment to uh, submitting uh, similar regulatory dossiers uh, in the countries where the trial was done, so ensuring that we don't have a prolonged period where, you know, kind of post-trial access is an issue. Um, and there is a commitment to sort of getting the dossier into SEPRA. SEPRA has been primed. We we shared the results with them. In fact, we talked with them throughout the trial. Um, and, you know, my understanding is that they they have briefed the company on what they would expect to, to see. Um, so, you know, kind of, I think from a licensure perspective, there's a real commitment and a real recognition that we need to move fast to get uh, HIV drugs approved for PrEP. Uh, the other piece, the WHO is, is enthusiastically waiting for the publication so that they can draft guidelines. The CDC have already drafted guidelines for the US and, um, you know, kind of have reached out actually to kind of understand better sort of what, what, what might be relevant in, in in our setting. So we have normative agencies that are kind of working as hard as they can with the data that they can to kind of get ready for those guidances. So I would say kind of if, if all the stars align, you know, kind of we could see cabotegravir coming to a place like South Africa in the next one to two years, you know, kind of from now. So we've already sort of had a year, but you know, one to two years from now. Yeah, it's fascinating and, and good to hear that there's so much enthusiasm for, for moving it forward quickly, as you say, given these pretty dramatic results. I mean, frankly, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know what your feelings are, I suppose every investigator once, you know, ho hopes that the trial works out positively, but I mean, this must have exceeded many people's expectations, you know, to, to, to be so much better than the, the standard of care, which is already pretty good. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. 20 years of working in HIV prevention for women, I can quite honestly say I've never seen a result quite like this. So, you know, kind of we were all a bit bowled over. Um, I think it's really exciting to have a product that would work for women. It's really been one of our biggest challenges is to find something that could prevent HIV in, in, in particularly in our region, uh, in people who, you know, young women who are infected uh, kind of at, at very high rates. So it was, it was very exciting. And, and it's good and, to pause and, re and reflect on that and say it's so often in one's career that you get an opportunity to see a positive result. So, so it really was a fantastic experience. Yeah, well, 
congratulations again from, from all of us. It's fantastic to see such positive results and such meaningful results for you know people in low and middle income settings around us. And of course, such, uh, such important leadership from local scientists. So congratulations. And um, hope, hopefully this, this goes from strength to strength and, and that we can get this moving quickly. And thanks, thanks very much for your time. We appreciate it greatly. And you've been very, very generous in answering so many questions, but lots of questions came in, which is a very good sign. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much for the invitation.